fish, but let's talk about some super segmentals. In other words, these are properties above the level of speech segments. So these might be properties that affect individual vowels or affect syllables. So we have pitch, length, and stress. Uh, pitch is just high to low frequency. So my pitch is pretty low, but it can also be a little bit higher. And pitch can break down into two different types. One is tone and one is intonation. A tone is usually on a syllable by syllable level and can affect the meaning of words, while intonation is going to change an utterance in its meaning. So it's not about changing the meaning of the words, but maybe changing whether you're asking a question or just saying a regular statement. Length is about how long a consonant or vowel is when you produce it. Some languages care about length, English does not. And then stress would be the most prominent syllable in a word. So we've already been talking a little bit about stress when it comes to identifying schwas in your speech. So the greatest example for tone would be Mandarin or Cantonese. And this is where we have different pronunciation of a certain vowel, depending on the pitch in your voice. And that pitch is going to affect the meaning. So as an English speaker, I would go through each of these five, five examples and say, ma, 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 ma. But uh, we need to have specific tones on these words in order for Mandarin speakers to actually understand what we're talking about. So we have a high tone like ma. We have a rising tone that's high like ma. We have a low rising, so it goes down and up as in ma. We have a high falling one, so one that starts high that goes low, ma. Uh, ma. And then we just have a neutral tone, ma, which would indicate a question. So what some linguists do instead of writing high, high rising, low rising, or using these symbols, they might also use numbers. So for example, a uh, high tone would be a five, five. So it's usually on a one, two, three, four, five scale. The first number is where it starts and the second number is where it ends. So this is a high, high, it's a five, five. Well, hemp, a high rising might start at three and go to five. So starts mid goes high. Uh, with horse, this is low rising. So it kind of goes from two to four. Uh, from high falling, this would start at five and go down to a three or a two. And then for any particle indicating a question, neutral would just be a standard three, three, or perhaps even lower. So those are another way that you can represent tones. Although in English, we don't need to care about these as much. Now here's some examples of intonation. And we have two different types of contour that we talk about. One is terminal contour and one is non-terminal contour. And you can see these in the diagrams to the right. So terminal contour is when the pitch goes down at the end of a sentence. So in English, we do this when we ask or when we just say regular statements. So people ask me silly questions. You can see it go down at the end. Now, non-terminal contour is when the pitch goes up at the end. So when we ask questions, we do this. So what are you talking about? That can go up. And even in some commands, like when you say leave, it can go higher. Usually most of my sentences end with a low contour. Oh, that's just a consequence of autism. In some case, I have difficulties controlling my pitch and intonation. Uh, but for most regular speakers, with questions and commands, it goes up, and with statements, it goes down. Although there is this new trend, if you listen to a lot of TikToks, where even regular statements will end on kind of a high tone. Like, people ask me silly questions? I, it's a regular statement, but sometimes people phrase it as if it's a question because they use non-terminal contour. So you might hear a difference in there just based on you know the type of media that you're listening to and what speakers are doing. Now, length is another one that we don't consider too much in English, but if you think about Japanese, length is actually going to make a difference in the word that is being produced. So, for example, we have two words here, kita and kita. So, in the first word, if we make the e longer, kita, this means here, and the specific form would mean the past. But if we make this shorter and just say kita, kita, in fact, in some cases, this vowel is even uh, de-voiced, so it's voiceless. It's shorter, and it means north. So how long you hold a sound is going to determine which meaning you're selecting when you're speaking. Now, in English, sometimes it just happens naturally. It's not going to affect the meaning of what we say. But if we have two of the same sound back to back, instead of pronouncing the sound twice, we might just lengthen it. 
So in a phrase like let's ban news, uh, let's ban news, I'm holding that N, I'm not pronouncing it twice. So what we would do is we'd write the N once and then put a little colon beside it to mean that it is lengthened. So even if you see the example above with kita and kita, we have the little colon there in the first example to symbolize that the sound is longer than usual. Now there is no set length for any of these sounds. So if you compare and ask, what about E and E? How long should we expect them to be? There's no concrete answer for this across languages. The only difference is that this is going to be longer. It could be 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds. It's uncertain. It's going to vary speaker by speaker. And the standard length is going to vary by language. So it just has to be longer. Now, stress. Primary stress is really what we want to focus on. And there's a couple different ways that we can represent this in our transcriptions or with our words. So we say the most prominent syllable in a word has primary stress. Usually the vowel is a little bit longer and it's usually not reduced. So if we pronounce the word explanation, explanation, that nay is getting primary stress. It's the longest and most prominent syllable in the word. And if it's difficult to hear, we can try putting primary stress on different syllables and see if that sounds weird. So explanation, explanation, that's a little bit weird. Explanation, explanation, that is very weird. And explanation, explanation, that's also a little bit weird. So if we say explanation, that is the most natural way to say it. So ne has primary stress. Now in regular writing, we can symbolize this with a little accent an up accent on the vowel, but in our IPA transcription, we usually use this little apostrophe-like symbol before the syllable that is stressed. So explanation, nay is stressed, so we put the little apostrophe before it. If we have secondary stress, like in the case of explanation, we do have a little bit of secondary stress two syllables away. We do the little apostrophe, but it would be on the bottom. I'm not quite sure what the name of that symbol is, but you can think of primary up top, and secondary on the bottom, if you have two syllables. We use that symbol there, the sigma in Greek writing for syllable. Now, in the case of telegraphic, we can hear primary stress on graph, telegraphic, and in insurmountable, we can hear primary stress on mount, insurmountable, insurmountable. It's not insurmountable, <laughs> it's not insurmountable, it's not insurmountable, and it's definitely not insurmountable. So primary stress is on mound there. And again, we can see in both of these transcriptions that we have our primary stress right before that syllable. So what stress can do in English sometimes, not always, this is not a hard and fast rule, but it can serve as a grammatical function. So we have some contrasts in words where we have a noun form and a verb form. And in the noun form, in two-syllable words, we put stress on the first syllable. So if we were to do our little sigmas here, we put stress on the first. And in the verb form, we would put stress on the second. So uh, announcing a recall versus recalling something. So you can hear a little bit of a difference there. Uh, another one, another example might be the word record. Is it record or is it record? So if it's record, then it's a noun. And this is talking about a physical disc that plays music. So that's a record. But if we talk about recording, this is now a verb. And here is an example of a microphone and then someone speaking into it. That's my picture of a human. So secondary stress, or not secondary stress, primary stress on the second syllable would give us record, which is the verb. Oh. See if you can identify primary stress in the following words. We won't transcribe them. We'll just put the little accent above the vowel in the stressed syllable. So in one, is it cupcake or cupcake? Well, it's cupcake, stress on the first syllable. What about amazing? Amazing, that is stressed on the second syllable. It's not amazing or amazing, it's amazing. Uh, what about repeatable? Well, this is in repeatable, the second one. It's repeatable. And finally, stuffing, stuff. So stuffing, our first syllable has that primary stress.